Hi, welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to be looking at how we can go about creating an Azure SQL database. Now, if this is your first time to my channel, I'm Trevor Williams, and I appreciate you taking the time out to view this video. If you haven't already done so, please hit that like button, subscribe to my channel so you can get more tutorials, and let me know in the comments how this video helped you as well as what other content you'd like to see from me. So let's get on with it. We're going to be creating an Azure SQL database and I'm going to get started. So first thing you want to do is log into your portal. So once you have logged in, I'm assuming that you have gone, created your account and logged in, or you already have an account and have logged in. What we want to do is start off by looking at the hamburger menu to the top left, and we're looking for SQL databases. So under SQL databases, you'll have the option to create a new one. So let us go ahead and do that. And that leads us to our wizard. So from the wizard, we can start putting in some configurations and we can get our SQL server or SQL database up and running in no time, really. So from here, we choose our subscription. So this is my subscription. You'll probably have a different one based on your account type. The resource group, you always want to create a resource group per set of resources per application. So in this case, the database is standalone. I'm not going to use one of my existing ones. I'm going to create a new one and I'm going to give it the name SQL demo dash RG. So I like to append RG to my resource group names. So it's clear that that's for a resource group, right? So SQL demo dash RG, then the database name, what do we want? So I'm going to call it SQL demo uh, dash DB. And you want to make sure of course that you are meeting all of the naming requirements. Now we move on to the server. So that was the name of the database. All databases need to be hosted on a server. Typically you would have installed a server or installed an SQL server instance on a machine and that would be your server. Now there's no machine here because we're taking the SaaS approach. Azure is hosting all of the infrastructure. We're just asking for a slice of that infrastructure so that we can put a database, at least one database right now. So what I have to do here is tell it with server. I don't have any servers created already, so I can just hit new, which will lead me to another wizard to create an SQL database server. So let us put in the server name, which has to be unique since it is going to be a public address, right? So whatever name you put in dot database dot windows dot net, that is the name that users will see, or sorry, you will need when you are connecting or doing anything relative to the server. So it is going to be a public link. You have to make sure that it is a unique one before you can proceed. Then you choose the most appropriate location based on where you are. And then we go down to the authentication method. So you can use SQL authentication, which means you create your own username and password. You can also set it up with Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, which is the Azure or the Azure hosted version of the domain, uh, well, Active Directory that would probably be deployed on your local domain or your local network. So I don't have that provision. I don't have any Azure Active Directory requirements. I can just use SQL authentication. You could also set up a hybrid if you needed to. So for the server admin login, I'm going to choose SQL admin. And the password, I need a nice strong password. So I use capital P at sign SSWORD1 which I think meets all the requirements of capital letter, special character and numeral. So we do all of that and then I can click OK. So once you have all green ticks, you're good to go. You click OK and then it now knows that it's supposed to create that server. Now, one thing that does pop up is the cost summary. So based on the configuration that you choose, this is how much it might cost you per month. And that's very important. So if you're doing this, um, it's 
very important that you do your cost analysis to make sure that you are one provisioning the right resources based on the application that you intend to host and two that the costs for the services are well within what your estimates are or your needs are so you always want to make sure that you pay attention to that and um, based on my subscription i got a little discount so you can always set up a pay as you go dev slash test so that you can see what it is like and get a feel of how the services look without being in a production environment, right? So one thing I'm going to change is the workload environment. So I'm going to make this a development workload environment. And then you can see that that drastically reduced my estimated costs. So before we move on from workload environment, there is an option right above it that asks us if we want a SQL elastic pool. You can always hover over this little eye icon, which will explain what the option is for. So Elastic Pools provide a simple and cost-effective solution for managing the performance of multiple databases within a fixed budget. So essentially, it's going to provision a set amount of resources. And you know that based on the set amount of resources, this is what I will be paying and a number of databases can use those resources. Of course, based on the configuration, the database will only use the resources that have been allocated to it. So it's a nice way to kind of preset the amount of resources you want and uh, get a better analysis or, or estimate of your potential costing. So we're not going to go with that. We can leave it on no. And then as we go down, we're going to see that we can go down to compute and storage where we can configure the type of database that we want. So let's look at our options here. So if I say configure database, they're going to ask, okay, what service tier would you like? Is it supposed to be a general purpose? Is it hyperscale or business critical? Of course, from the descriptions, you can tell what each one would be for. Then you also have DTU, so you have vCore based purchasing model versus DTU-based purchasing model. So vCore essentially is going to provision resources. It's not really watching or wondering how many data read writes you're doing. It's just provisioning resources like it's saying, these are the resources you get. General purpose versus hyperscale, you get more resources, more scalability versus business critical, where you get enough resources for a lot of read write operations and you get resiliency, so you get built-in data recovery settings. Versus DTU-based, where you can, well, a DTU is, DTU is short for data transfer unit. So each read-write operation is a DTU pretty much. So you can estimate that, okay, based on the type of application, these would be the read-write operations that I'm expecting. So you would want to choose the correct size based on what you are doing. So for this demo and to cut costs, we can choose basic. And then they're telling us that on the basic, we get a max of, well, we get to choose. Okay, so the max here is two for me, right? So that is it. But then you can always compare the service tiers if you need to and compare the D2 options so that you're better informed. So at the end of this operation, the basic package is going to give me $5 per month. That's my costing, all right? So I can apply that. That's fine with me. And see, everything is set. So you want to make sure that you pay attention to these little things because once again, they do have implications on how much money you spend versus how resilient or not your provision of your SQL database will be. Then we move on to redundancy. So do we want local redundant versus zone redundant versus geo redundant? Local redundant means that within every, within every, data center for Azure Cloud, there are three copies of whatever it is, whatever resource I've chosen LRS, locally redundant storage for, there are going to be three copies in that particular data center. Then I can go to networking. So from here, I want to make sure that I can connect to the SQL server, right? So choose an option for configuring connectivity. I would like it to be a public endpoint. Why? Because I might need to access it from 
my machine, which is not in the cloud, um, I might need to access it from another machine, right? Of course, you want to be very careful with that, but I do want a public endpoint so I can access it across the internet. Then they'll ask, do you want to allow Azure services and resources access to the server? You would want to say yes if you have applications that are going to be deployed to Azure that need to talk to the resource. And they'll also ask, do you want to add your current IP address? So I'm going to leave this one as no because I'm going to show you later on what that procedure looks like when you're trying to connect. And then you have connection policies. I'll just leave that as default. And then we can jump over to security. So I don't think that we have to go through any other security because we could just skip through this one. Anything without a star is not absolutely necessary. So for me, none of these things is necessary. And additional settings, we can choose a data source. So I could choose a sample data source and that uses adventure work. So I'll just use the sample data source so that when it is provisioned, we have a database, but you could also back up or select a backup if there was one, but let's go with the sample so that we can actually have something. Then I'm going to skip tags and I'm just going to go to review and create. So here on this page, they're just confirming our settings. At any point you can go back and you can change your settings. You can also go ahead and look at downloading a template for automation. So this would give you access to what we call the ARM template or Azure Resource Manager template. And this is really just a huge JSON file that outlines certain specifications for the resource or resources that need to be provisioned. And you can actually just download this and reuse it if you need to have consistency with provisioning resources. So I'm not going to use that ARM template instead. I'm just going to go ahead and create. So I'll allow the portal to go ahead and create. It will validate everything. And you can give it probably about 30 to 30 seconds to two minutes, depends. And it will go ahead and provision your resources. So let's give that a little time. Then we have it provisioned. So if we go to resource, then we will see our SQL demo and we can start interacting with it, right? So if I go to overview, this is the actual database, right? So here's our resource group, but then over here we see the actual server name. And if you needed to connect via application, then you can show database connection strings. And it would actually show you all the different ways that you could write a connection string in order to connect. So let us try to connect using our local SQL server application. So you have two options when it comes to connecting from your machine. You can use the SQL Server Management Studio, or you can use the Azure Data Studio. So I'm going to use the Azure Data Studio because that's open source. So even if you're not using a Windows machine, you should be able to use the Data Studio and do a connection. So let's launch that. And then we can say create a connection. So from here, we can specify the connection type and the server. So the server is that address that we had put in earlier. So that's the server. Authentication type has to be SQL login, at which point we provide the credentials that we had specified. And then I can connect. Now, this is why I did not opt to enable the firewall rule to add my IP because I wanted you to see this. So what happens is that when you try to connect, if it doesn't have the rule for you, then it's going to say, oh, well, there's a firewall rule. Would you like to add it? So at this point, you'd want to make sure that your credentials are up to date. Let me update mine. And once it's satisfied with whatever you're providing, you want to add your IP address. Alternatively, you can add a range if you know exactly the range you're looking for. One thing that I've done in the past is just to enable all access is just add that range from 0 to 255.255.255.255. You could do that, not recommending it, but for now, I'll just use my client IP address and then go ahead and hit OK. It will go off, create that firewall rule, 
and then try to connect me and here we are connected. So now I can actually start interacting with my database. So here's a database that I provisioned and because I chose the sample for AdventureWorks, I have access to all of these tables. So I can select top 1000 and everything beyond this would be very similar to what we would experience if we were using a local database or, or interacting with a database over a local network. It's the same principle. It's just that this one is going across the internet to our now provisioned Microsoft Azure SQL database. So guys, that's it for this demo. Thank you for joining me. I hope you got something out of this experience and feel free to leave comments in the comment section to let me know how much you enjoy this video versus what else you would like to see. Hit that like button to show your support and do subscribe. So thank you and I'll see you in the next lesson.